Welcome to Manufacturing 301, the 3M Optimizing for Global Supply Chain with AWS. I'm Douglas Bellin. I look after our global business development at Smart Factory within the AWS area. Today with me is Caitlin Finn and Josh Joshua, who are going to be talking to us about what 3M has done across their supply chain and being able to build some applications on top of the, the AWS environment. First, let me talk to you very quickly on what AWS in manufacturing is going after. And if you've hopefully listened to the keynotes from Andy and the other announcements that we've had over the past few weeks, you'll see quite a bit coming out around AWS in the industrial marketplace. Overall, when AWS works with our customers, we work across many different areas within their operational environment. This includes marketing and sales, taking that wealth of information of what are you selling who's using that information, looking at engineering and design and working with customers to move their high performance computing to the virtually unlimited storage and compute capability to no longer have to worry about batching to be able to do things like R&D capabilities, your CAD, your CAM, your CAE and other type of workloads that are incredibly relevant to your business and your customers as they're doing new product introductions. Moving from engineering and design, customers move into manufacturing operations. In other words, now that I've designed the product, how do I make it? Working with simulation capabilities and production scheduling to understand what should be made, when it should be made, and where it should be made so we can ship it to our customers on time. Once it's being made, we need to look at things like quality aspects, making sure that we have the right number of products coming down our assembly line, not just down our assembly line, but that they are at the right quality level of what our customers accept from us. Moving into our supply chain, both inbound logistics, what are our suppliers sending to us and making sure that the quality of those products are good, being able to develop those and drive that into information flow. So if I make a customer change in an order, my suppliers are aware of that as quick as possible so they can make sure that they're shipping us the right product. Once that product is built, we move into manufacturing and moving it into the distribution standpoint. How does it dwell in our warehouses? How long does it dwell in our warehouses? And ultimately, how do we then move that across the logistics, 3PLs and 4PLs and others, to make sure it gets to our customers so they can react to it and use it. We can start looking at our service chain offerings. What is the warranty? How is that product being used? And ultimately looking at that life cycle of the product, both from gestation all the way down to, if we really get into this, fully into a circular economy. In other words, how do we decommission that product and use parts of that product for other capabilities or recycle it as we go forward? And then ultimately looking at our business operations. In other words, the back end office capabilities that we have, our ERP systems, our other workloads that are very important to our operations, but may not be as key to what we're doing from a manufacturing insight. All of these come together. All of these have relevant information flows and relevant data stores to what you're doing from a business operation standpoint. When we look in the smart factory capabilities, we look at multiple different use cases that our customers come to us. And hopefully as you've seen with some of the new services that we've launched with Amazon AWS for industrial, you'll see some capabilities that are making it easier to help our customers do predictive maintenance, do quality and computer vision for uh, quality control aspects of our customers of, as they're looking at those products. Being able to do computer vision no longer just at the end of the line, but now across the line and really looking and understanding where the quality of that product could potentially might have an issue. Ultimately driving that into material management and other capabilities so we can do track and trace. Building a single holistic OE visualization dashboard from an enterprise view. Being able to go from the enterprise down to the site down to the asset, down to the location, be able to do comparison and co contrasting across all of that to be able to really have that visibility. Start doing better planning, start doing better optimization of where I'm building and why I'm building these products. Being able to build that into potentially a digital twin so we can start to see what our digital representation is of these products as they're running in real time. But that's enough for me. Let's actually understand how 3M has done this with a product that they built called 3M Spider. Caitlin, over to you. Thank you for the insights and looking forward to this. Hello, and welcome to our presentation on the Spider application. We're glad to have you tuned in. And my team and I are excited to share with you the powerful application we developed to better understand our supply chain. First, I would like to introduce our development team. 
My name is Caitlin, and my partners in crime are Josh and Anish. We'll start off with a brief demo of our application, and then get into the nitty gritty of the backend tools that power our app. Let me start off by explaining the problem my team and I were trying to solve. The short and sweet version is that our stakeholders were using unmanageably large spreadsheets to attempt to analyze the flow of products and materials through our supply chain, in addition to their associated sales and business impact. As you can imagine, this process was very cumbersome, involved expert spreadsheet manipulation, and even for data experts, it was difficult to understand or have confidence in the data they were manipulating. My team and I were tasked with finding a solution that would move our stakeholders from cumbersome spreadsheet analysis to an easy plug and play visual analysis. It was originally intended for the previously mentioned stakeholders, but as we progressed, others began to see the power of our creation. This application leverages many AWS technologies, including Neptune Graph Database, X-Ray, Elasticsearch, Lambda, Route 53, DynamoDB, S3, CloudFront, and more. You can try to guess how these technologies are used during the demo, or just hold tight and my teammate will expand on their usage shortly. All right, on to the demo. Our application allows me to search for specific material SKUs or keywords to retrieve sales information related to that search. Let's use something relevant to this crazy year we're enduring. Let's say I'm interested in understanding the sales for one of the materials used in our N95 respirators. For those of you that are not familiar, these respirators have been in high demand for frontline workers during the pandemic, and the main filter component is made up of a polypropylene fiber. So I will enter in the keyword polypropylene and click on sales. While we're waiting, I should mention that this search process used to take hours, but my team and I have reduced it to a matter of seconds. The data coming back from this query is real, fresh data pulled from the cloud and sourced from Teradata. As you can see, I'm able to see the business groups, divisions, product groups, and products, in addition to the associated sales for my search. We can see that polypropylene is widely used in our products within four of our business groups, transport electronic, safety and industrial, healthcare, and consumer. Now let's say I want to know more about our personal safety division. As you can see, the majority of the sales in this division that contain polypropylene come from the filtering face piece respirator product group. If I drill into this group, you can see there are many products that have polypropylene associations. If I click on this red graph icon, I'll be redirected to a graphical view of our raw material polypropylene and the paths to all the finished goods or products that we just saw in this list. The green nodes of the graph indicate a raw material in our case, containing polypropylene. The black nodes are the materials that comprise the supply chain path for this product, and the blue nodes of the graph indicate a finished product. From this, I'm able to do several things. The first thing I'm interested in is looking for a particular item by description. So how about I look for one of our N95 respirators? I can search N95 respirator and click on the one I want. Notice it takes me to that node in the graph. From here, I can understand the product flow from my raw material polypropylene to my finished product, which is the N95 respirator. I can also see the plants or sites that the material went through to create the finished good. And if I'm interested in the impact of this material on a particular plant, let's say our 3M Hassang health and safety site, I can get a visual of the materials that go through this plant. Speaking of plants, I can also view the flow of polypropylene through our plants. If I return to the dashboard and click on plants, I'll be taken to a view of all the plants and flows for my keyword polypropylene. As you can imagine, this is a huge graph. So instead of generating a massive graph I can't comprehend, I'm going to look for a specific material within the polypropylene search result by clicking on this info button. This gives me a large list of the material numbers returned by my polypropylene search. I'm gonna filter on a copoly. And if I click on the plant button for this copoly material, it will take me to the plant view. This view allows me to analyze the inputs and outputs of our plants for the polypropylene copoly material. If I click on a plant, I can view the inputs, outputs, and the next site in the flow where applicable. I can also search for an input or output and find which plant it relates to. 
I'll just select a random output here, such as this 5402 tape product, and you can see that it is located for me on the graph. Upon inspection, I can see that it is an output of the 3M Hilden site. In summary, our application ended up far exceeding the needs of our stakeholders and is now being used by several other groups within 3M to better understand our supply chain questions. Not only does it help our data experts understand the data better, but it gives them a tool to communicate this data to others in a visual manner that could not be communicated before. I will now pass the presentation on to Josh to expand on our application architecture. Thanks, Caitlin. Now that we've seen the Spider front end in action, I want to take a few minutes to walk you through how we leveraged AWS services to build the backing architecture and how this architecture matured during the course of the project. In Scrum at 3M, we often use the evolution of a skateboard to a scooter to a bike and finally to a car as an analogy for how software prototypes iteratively improve during the course of a project. Let's use this analogy to explore the iterations that Project Spider underwent. Prior to the project, if our stakeholders needed specific supply chain data, they would have to make a manual request to a team of data engineers and developers who would run a sequence of queries and scripts to generate massive CSVs of data. The delivery of these data files could take more than a week to fulfill, and our stakeholders would still need to perform lots of manual pivots and Excel manipulations before they were even usable for their needs. When we began this project, our initial charter was to automate this process in order to make the delivery of these spreadsheets faster and more standardized. To achieve the ETL needed for this process, we elected to use an EMR cluster, as this allowed us the ability to manipulate the data programmatically using Apache Spark, and because we could spin a, a wide, as wide a cluster as we needed to achieve the performance we were looking for. We wanted to make sure that the data was secure in the cloud environment, so we locked down our backend within a VPC and used KMS to encrypt all of our data. We began working on our automation, designing a step function that would tr be triggered automatically when new data was pulled into our data import S3 bucket. This step function also creates and terminates the EMR cluster so that it's not running all the time, incurring unnecessary cost. Finally, to securely deliver the reports that our EMR Spark job generated to our stakeholders, we used a combination of Pinpoint and SES to send emails containing pre-signed URLs to the reports as a last step in our ETL automation process. After delivering our stakeholders their skateboard, their lives became much easier, as they could get their hands on the data they needed much faster and in a format that was delivered that was much more usable right out of the box. However, using a CSV as the vessel for delivering this data, there were only so many ways we could improve its presentation. We knew that to get to a scooter, we would need to implement some sort of user interface. After Caitlin joined our team, she began working on a UI layout and developing a prototype using Angular JavaScript. We deployed this front end in an S3 bucket behind a CloudFront distribution with a Route 53 hosted zone and a WAF, ensuring only IP addresses corresponding to 3M on-prem and VPN connections were able to connect to the application. We also stood up our first iteration of our API using API Gateway, allowing the front end to make requests to the back end of our system. The first feature that we implemented in our UI was a way to view and download the CSV reports securely from the S3 bucket where they reside. After we got this screen and functionality working, we changed the email functionality to send notifications when new reports were generated, rather than the actual pre-signed URLs to download the reports. We also gave the users the ability to opt in or out of these email notifications and save this user info in Dynamo. At this point, our stakeholders had a scooter with a front end that they could use to interact with our back end through an API. We then shifted our focus to coming up with a better way than CSVs to present the data using this new UI. One comment that our stakeholders had about our scooter design was that the UI restricting connections by IP address was not optimal. They wanted the ability to instead restrict access using 3M credentials so that the system could be accessed remotely by users that are authorized. To achieve this, we set up a security group in our company's Azure AD and integrated Auth0 as the means to authenticate into our front end. When a user logs in, their employee ID was used to query an on-prem LDAP server to verify their security group membership. This authorization check passed, they'd be issued a security token and allowed into our portal. This token was then included in all the requests to our API and verified at each endpoint to prevent any injections. During our bicycle stage development, we also began testing different relational data models and DB solutions, such as RDS and Aurora. 
We also began tinkering with different UI elements, such as interactive tables, to present the data in a more efficient way to our stakeholders. However, we quickly realized that we would not be able to achieve the performance we desired using traditional related, relational databases, given the query patterns that our stakeholders required and the sheer volume of data that we were dealing with. Luckily, we had a brilliant data engineer on our team who quickly realized that our data was a perfect candidate for a graph database. This led us to our final design change that really set us on the path to our final MVP, incorporating AWS Neptune as our database solution. After coming up with a graph data model and deciding on how the front end library on what front end library we would use to display it, we modified our EMR Spark job to not only generate the CSV reports our stakeholders needed, but also to generate the edge and vertex files that we would need to load into Neptune. This led to the final form of our prototype in its evolution, the car. In our final design, we added a second step function to fully automate not just the creation of the Neptune Edge and Vertex files, but also the loading of the data. We also realized that even with the power of Neptune, there would still be some queries that would take too long to return a response to the front end in a synchronous manner. To solve this problem, we implemented asynchronous result handling and used S3 as a shared cache for the asynchronous results. We also wanted to provide the ability to do full text searches on our data, something that Neptune's not particularly good for. Luckily, AWS provides another service that we leverage for this functionality, Elasticsearch. Neptune queries can be supplied in Elasticsearch index to be used for full text searching, assuming that the searchable documents are in sync with the Neptune data. In order to create and maintain this synchronous relationship, we, pr uh, we uh, we created yet another step function, which replicates any data from Neptune database into our ES cluster. This is achieved by leveraging the Kinesis stream filter that's built into Neptune, which provides a change log of all the events on the Neptune database. Finally, as the project progressed and generated interest within our organization, our group of stakeholders became larger and more diverse. Unsurprisingly, the parts of the supply chain that certain stakeholders were concerned with differed from the parts that others were. The conflicting rules that we were receiving from our various stakeholders led us to implement custom filters that a user could apply, either on certain sets of inputs or globally, to tailor the results that they would receive to just the data that they actually cared about. We also streamlined our backend, deprecating our authorization lambda in favor of integrating the AD check directly using an Auth0 rule, and deprecating the report functionality altogether, as it became entirely unused after we rolled out the node graph visualizations that Caitlin demoed for you before. The back end of our final design is completely serverless, using lambdas to back our API in an event-driven automated ETL process orchestrated by step functions. There's no compute nodes running hot. Everything is provisioned when needed and terminated after use. Our system is also scalable by design, both due to the nature of our serverless architecture and the ability to resize and scale out our DB and Spark clusters as needed. Security is also a key feature that our stakeholders demanded, which is we achieved using a VPC, data being encrypted everywhere in, in the back end of our system, both in transit and at rest, and our front end and API authentication provided by Auth0. Finally, we implemented some maintainability features, such as dashboards and x-ray tracing for monitoring, to assist the team that we hand this MVP off to in the long run. This project was a fantastic candidate to showcase the utility of many AWS services and how they can be combined into powerful solutions to complex problems. I hope you enjoyed the overview of our architecture and that you can join us for Q&A. Thank you.